All You're right. on. We're, we're on. Good, good yeah. to have, uh, good to have each one of you here. Good to have uh, Justin back. Good to have Jamie back. Good to have Brenda at the piano. That was nice. Very nice. Uh, there are mistakes that you can make, like out of order of the bulletin, that are obviously not a big deal. Uh, and then there are bigger mistakes. You ever, so, so those of you that can spell and visualize, I know that's two biggies at the same time. But if you take the word nowhere, N-O-W-H-E-R-E, -E, you take the word nowhere, you can say, God is nowhere. Or you can put one little space in there between the W and the H, and you can say, God is now here. And the words are saying, there's a little space put in there, right? That's the only difference. Well, I did the unthinkable on your outline. I don't know how many of you have found it, but of all the places to leave out one tiny little letter, um, this could get me thrown out of the church. This could get our website destroyed as being a heretic. So here's what I want you to do just for me. Uh, I discovered this after I had printed out all the copies, but look at number two. Number two, reason one to preach Christ because the wisdom of the word does not lead us to God. That is a very false statement. That is the opposite of what I wanted to say. So you have to take a little letter, L, and put it in that word, word, and make the word, word, world. Whew! You got all that? Because the wisdom of the world does not lead us to God. There, I got that off my chest. I was like, wow, that's all I need to do is have you think I believe that. I obviously do not believe that. So, uh, there's mistake number one. Well, maybe it's up to about five now, but anyway. So, when you hear the word cross... What pops into your mind? What's the first thing you think of when you hear the word cross? Some people think of it as something that is connected to church. It's in a church or connected to a church or it's on top of a church. Uh, others think of the cross as a piece of jewelry, something you, you wear on earrings or something that you wear on a necklace. Uh, still others think of cross as a a burden or a trial uh, in their life. Others, hopefully you, think of the cross as a reminder of the place where Christ died uh, as our, so to be our substitute and to be our Savior, to save us from the penalty of hell. There's one more group, and hopefully this is not you, but there's a group, and it might be larger than we think, that think the cross is foolishness, that it is absurdity. Uh, the Greek word is moronity, moron-like. There are people that think that about the cross. And like I just said, uh, that group might be larger than what we think it is. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in the New Testament using a pew Bible. It's page 841. 841. You need to use your table of contents to find it. I don't say that, but it's all right. Don't be bashful. I want you to, I want you to find it. I want you to look at it as I'm reading it so you can see it for yourself. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 18 through 25. That's the, the paragraph, uh, and it lends itself to continuity if we read the whole paragraph. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, again, page 841, verses 18 through 25. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But on us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy 
the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preached Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Probably noticed right out of the gate, verse number 18, preaching the crosses to them that, fool, that perish foolishness, uh, like I, I talked about. Hopefully you also notice that it talks about wise and wisdom and wiser. And then I hope you noticed that it talks about Christ and Christ crucified and Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. And so there's way too much here to unpack uh, every verse. I got I to gotta tell you a funny story. I, I wasn't going to. This is kind of vulnerable. And um, <clears throat> I haven't changed my ways yet, okay? I'm working on it. But I like to get into the minutia, the details of the word. And the other, I, I was struggling, and the other morning I woke up to these words in my head. You're preaching a sermon, not writing a commentary. I'm like, wow, where did that come from? So sometimes I work too hard at writing a commentary and we don't, we, we can't, you can't do that. So I'm, I'm working on that. I preach the word, but explain the word. And so I'm, I, I take seriously what does it say, not what does I want it, but what do I want it to say. And so that's a, if, if you pray for your pastor, pray that uh, God will give me wisdom and, and direction in that regard. But I want to, verse 23 is going to kind of serve as the overarching thought, and mainly just the first few words. But we preach Christ crucified. And before we talk about why we preach Christ crucified, I want to look at who the who is supposed to preach Christ crucified? You already know from your outline that each of us need to do that. And we're going to look at why uh, in just a moment. God says so is why, but we'll, we'll expand on that a little bit. And then uh, look at why preach Christ, what the, is the importance of Christ is. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for the precious gift of your word. You declare unto us what is your thought. You tell us who we are. You tell us who our needs are. You tell us how you are able uh, to meet those needs. And uh, Lord, I thank you that you revealed to us that you sent Christ and that he came to be the Savior and that that message needs to be shared. And Lord, I, I thank you that uh, you know our want to's you know our sins you know our struggles you know our hang ups uh, you know everything about us we thank you that you lovingly take us as we are we thank you that you put up long with us even though many of us have been your child for a long time and Lord I just ask that you would help us now to set aside the cares of our day and the cares of our life and the plans of the week and just focus our time and our uh, attention and not just our ears but our heart on what you want to talk to us about changes that uh, we need to make uh, 
Lord, help us to let down our defenses and just want to obey you because we love you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number one, why we all need to preach Christ. Why we all need to preach Christ. Notice I have preach in quotations. Paul is not saying that every one of us, and this would be fascinating, that every one of us is supposed to line up one by one and come up here and stand behind the pulpit and preach a sermon on Christ and his crucifixion. Some of you are shaking your head like, no way, I don't want to do that. That would be interesting. Um, it would be long, maybe. Uh, maybe there would be a lot of pass, 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 pass. Pretty soon I'm up here. Anyway, but... Um, Paul is not saying that everybody is supposed to stand behind a pulpit and proclaim God's word. Uh, to, to preach means to be a herald, to be a proclaimer, to be a sharer. Uh, letter A, how do we know that each one of us is supposed to preach Christ? We're supposed to share our faith. Letter A, because God through Paul says it applies to all of us. Verse 23. Three says, but we preach Christ. Paul did not, Paul, Paul used the word we, which is the first person plural. That means we, me, and you, the people that he's talking to. Paul did not say, me and the leaders of Corinth preach Christ. He did not say, I preach Christ. He said, we. That means him and who he was talking to. And he was talking to believers in a church in the city of Corinth. And he was saying to them, we, you and I, as believers, preach Christ. We proclaim Christ. Well, pastor, I, I'm not so sure about that. Well, Let's go on. Letter B. Paul was not the only one who says this. Jesus said it as well. Jesus says it applies to all of us. Uh, I gave you on your outline the verses. You don't, uh, don't need to turn there, but Matthew chapter 28. In, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus gives, 18, 19, 20, Jesus gives some of his last words before he went to heaven. Uh, some call it the marching orders to the church. Uh, others call it the Great Commission. But it is the last instructions that Jesus said, okay, I'm going to heaven. And here's what I want you to do because I'm going to heaven. Notice verse number 18 there on your outline. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Power here does not refer to physical might or strength. Jesus certainly, all power is given unto Jesus. Jesus spoke the world into existence, so certainly all physical strength and might is at his disposal. But the word here is not that kind of power. It has to do with authority. It has to do with the right to tell us what to do. And Jesus said, because I rose from the dead, and because I give you salvation, and because I give you forgiveness of sins, I have the authority as the leader of the church to tell you what to do. So all authority is given unto me, and then he says to, based on that, here's what I want you to do. What did he tell? What did Jesus, the leader of his people, tell the disciples to do? Verse number 19, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the word teach there is not just pass on information. It includes that, but it's more than that. The word teach there is disciple. It is to disciple people, to share Christ with them, to help them understand their need of forgiveness and their need of Savior. But once they are saved, to instruct them on how to be a follower 
of Jesus. And then as a follower of Jesus, they should be baptized. We have Elise and Linda and Roger who have been going through lessons, and they are going to be baptized here in the near uh, future. And so that's, a, that's an exciting thing. And that's, why do you need to be baptized? You need to be baptized because Jesus says that's what, the, it's a sign of obedience. Amen. Go, make disciples, become a disciple, and then be baptized. And so it also means to not only receive the message for yourself and not only be baptized, but we are also, according to verse number 20, we are to teach others to do the same thing. So let's, let's think about this for a minute. Did the disciples obey these words from Jesus? They did, didn't they, right? They, they obeyed, but they died a long time ago. In fact, many of them died at a young age. Most of them were martyred. Only John lived to be an old man. The message didn't die with them. Why didn't the message die with them? Because God built like a, a propagating provision in the command. And it's in verse 20. Teaching them, those that are disciples, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of of the world. So simply put, the original disciples were taught how to lead people to Jesus and how to make disciples, how to grow them, how to make disciples from those ones that were saved, and then to baptize them, and then to teach them to do the same thing. To do the same thing. So they were taught. They taught others to do what they had been taught. And so the question is, or the comment first is, you and I are believers today because the apostles did what they were supposed to do. They made disciples, but they taught those disciples how to make disciples. And those disciples in turn made disciples. And so we, you and I, if we are a believer, are a believer because People obeyed the command of Jesus to go and make disciples and treat your, teach your disciples how to make other disciples. A week or so ago, I, I had this thought. And it's not like God came to me like he did to Solomon and say, hey, you know, if you have one wish, <laughs> here's what it is. I think it's because I, you know, I want um, I was reading grandkids about Jeannie yesterday, so maybe that had something in it, but it was well before this. So I, I had this thought. If there was one thing I would like to see in our church, what would it be? And I had this thought. If I, my, my heartbeat would be this. All of us loved God so much that we couldn't help but share it with other people. That's, that's, that's what, that's my heart. I believe that's Jesus' heart. That we loved him so much that it wouldn't, we feel forced or guilted into sharing our faith. It's, we can't help it. The, the apostle said, we cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Back to verse number 23. The message is for all of us. All of us are to preach. All of us are to be sharers of the message of the cross. That's, that's the who. What I want to look at now is why Christ crucified? Why preach Christ crucified? On your outline, reason number one, so it's number two, but reason number one to preach Christ, it's because the wisdom of the world does not lead us to God. You already got the L in there, right? The wisdom of the world does not lead us to God. Verse 21 plainly states that. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those 
that believe. So stated another way, God in his wisdom determined that man would not come to know God through wisdom. Why? Is God anti-intellectual? Anti intellectual? Anti-intellectual? I can say it. Anti-intellectual? Is he against us using our brains? Is he against us using our minds? Well, obviously not, because for the past two Sundays, we've been talking about in Ephesians 5, walk circumspectly, which is carefully, and not as fools, but as wise. And so Paul, in Ephesians 5, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, walk wisely. And here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, the wisdom of the world doesn't lead you to God. There's not a contradiction, because here is the difference. The wisdom of God is knowing and learning the mind of God through the Word of God. The wisdom of the world is man's thoughts and opinions from man's mind shared on paper or books or whatever the case may be. That is the difference. The wisdom that God wants us to seek is from his mind through his word. And that is a vast difference between what man opinionates, opines. So back to our verse. Man's intellectual pursuit of wisdom does not lead them to God. Uh, verse number 19 says God destroys the wisdom of the wise and he brings to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So, so God destroys the wisdom of the world. But why does, why does he do that? number of reasons, are, here's three I'm, I'm going to give you. Uh, number one, I believe I have these on your outline. If intellect and philosophy were required to know God, many of us would be in trouble. Right? If you had to be a, a super smart philosophical debater, like Charlie Kirk and, you know, some of the... Um, Ron Ray Rhodes, I think it is, you know, he, he goes and has conversations with people on the beach and he's very smart. I am super good at coming up with super, I'm not bragging because let me finish. I'm super good at coming up with super good answers two days after the fact. You know, that doesn't work very good when you're trying to debate someone, okay? Paul says this, God says this, if intellect and philosophy was required, Many of us would be in trouble because he goes on to see verse 20, look at verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. Look at yourself, Corinthians. There's not too many brainy, brainiacs among you. And so intellect, we, we should be thankful that being intellectually smart and being philosophically savvy and being able to grasp all these abstract concepts is not required for us to get to heaven. Number two, if intellect and philosophy were required to know God, there would be arrogancy and boasting. People would be bragging about what they know, not humble and grateful and appreciative for what God did. They would be proud about what they did. And so if wisdom is the way to get to God, they would, there would be bragging. And you know what I'm going to say, right? If there's bragging in heaven, heaven ceases to be heaven. And God says as much, verse 28, no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse, the end of verse 31, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. If you're going to boast, if you're going to brag, Paul says in Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our glory cannot be in what we do or in what we know. It is in what Christ did for us. I beat on this drum quite, quite regularly, but I'm, I'm going to do it again. Man's wisdom 
oftentimes gets in the way. Man makes logic their lord, little l. And they set themselves up as a judge over God's word and decide this is good, that's not, this is good, that's not, this is relevant, that's not. And they pick and choose like a chicken scratching through gravel looking for something to eat. They pick and choose through the word of God. And so they set themselves up as a judge over God's word instead of understanding the reality, God's word will judge them. And so intellect and philosophy and wisdom would lead to arrogancy. And so we need to preach number three, uh, and the small number three, I should say, uh, because intellect and philosophy don't lead us to God, people need to know what will lead them to God. They need to know it is not what they know, it is who they know, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, and you think about all the crazy stuff. We're, we're spending billions to send machines to Mars to maybe find a speck of this and find us and all this wisdom pursuit for what? It's foolishness. The way to God is not through a speck on Mars. It's through the Word of God. And so we need to let, that's what people, that's why people need to know. Reason one to share the message of the cross is because the world's wisdom doesn't lead them to God. Uh, number three on your outline, number three on your outline, which is reason number two to preach Christ, it's because Christ crucified is the power of God. Look again at verse number 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ crucified is the power of God. But how can that be? Think about that. How can God in the flesh, beaten and mocked and ridiculed and spit on and half naked, hanging on a cross, how is that power? How is that power? To the human mind, it is not power. Certainly not, well, you could say, well, maybe it's not power like physical power. It's authority. But no, the word power here is strength. It's might. It is force. So again, how does the cross and Jesus on the cross display the strength and the might of God? Letter A, God's power is not always about appearance. God's power is not always about about appearance. Verse 22, the Jews require a sign. What's a sign? A miracle, right? They wanted to see proof that he was who he said he was. You know, if you read the Gospels at all, it seems Jesus did miracles fairly often, but they were never satisfied. One more sign. One more miracle. One more proof. Never enough. People really haven't changed. People still want proof. They don't want to walk by faith. They want to walk by sight. They want God to do something to prove his power. And God proved his power at the cross. And we have a recording of that in God's word. And so the very thing that looks like a pitiful display of weakness is the power of God. That's what God says. Letter B. God's power is not the outward appearance. God's power is about what it accomplishes. 
But God's power is about what it accomplishes. What was accomplished at the crucifixion of Christ? Probably should have mentioned this earlier. I, I don't think Paul is focusing on the crucifixion to the point of ignoring the resurrection. I, I think the gospel is both. Christ died, was buried, rose again. That's the good news. Uh, you really cannot have one without the other. And I believe when Paul says, I pre we preach Christ, he's talking about uh, the whole message. Because neither one can stand by itself. If you don't have one, you cannot have the other. If Jesus did not die, there would be no resurrection. If Jesus was not resurrected, he would have been alive. Because he said, I'm rising again. Several, multiple times. He said, I will rise again. So if he didn't rise again, he would have been a liar. If he was a liar, he was a sinner. If he was a sinner, he could not be your substitute or my substitute. And so the, the power of Christ crucified is both the death and resurrection of Christ. So what does the crucifixion and the resurrection accomplish? One word, right? Salvation. Yep. Salvation. End of verse number 18. End of verse number 18. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Verse, end of verse number 21. Please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe question we should always ask ourselves when we see the word save or saved or salvation is saved from what? Enemies? Death? Financial ruin? No. Hell. How do we know? From the context. We know from the context. Again, verse number 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Perish is the opposite of saved. Saved is the opposite of perish. So if you want to know what saved means in the context, what does perish mean? Does perish mean that after you die, you cease to exist? Some people teach that. When you perish... There is no more you. You cease to exist. The Bible doesn't teach that. Look, at I gave you some verses on your outline there. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Can the wrath of God abide on someone if they cease to exist? No. John 5, 24, Jesus said, all these verses, John 3 was Jesus' words, or no, they're John's words, but John, John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation but it's passed from death unto life. If you believe on Christ, you will not come into condemnation. If you don't believe on Christ, you will come into condemnation. But again, if you cease to exist, what is condemnation? Only existing people can be condemned. John 8, 24, another one on your outline there. Jesus said, I said, Jesus is speaking, said, I've said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. What would be so bad about dying in your sins if you cease to exist after your body dies? And then Matthew 25, 41, then shall he, Jesus, we've been looking at, we looked at this for a few Wednesday nights, then shall Jesus say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire 
prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, I ask, would you really be cursed if you ceased to exist after you die? You wouldn't be. Would you be cast into a place, an everlasting place, if you cease to exist? Obviously not. There is an existence after this life. We have a soul that will spend eternity with God in heaven. Uh, there will be a thousand years stay on, on earth uh, is included in that. But those that don't have Christ are under the condemnation of God. And so Christ crucified and Christ resurrected is the power of God that keeps us out of that state. We are forgiven and saved from that penalty because of what Christ did on the cross and because of his resurrection. Resurrection. Uh, reason number one to preach Christ because wisdom of this world doesn't lead us to God. Reason number two, because Christ crucified is the power of God. Uh, number four on your outline, which is reason number three, because Christ crucified is the wisdom of God. Christ crucified is the wisdom of God. It says that in our verse, verse number 24, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. But how is a crucified, resurrected Christ the wisdom of of God. I've given you these thoughts in different forms various times, so they probably won't be brand new, but even if you heard them a while back, it's still good to refresh our memories. So here, here is how Christ crucified and Christ resurrected is how we can say why Paul says, why God says that that is the wisdom of of God. For us to be saved, be free from the penalty of our sins, three attributes of God have to be satisfied. Three attributes have to be satisfied. Letter A, God is holy. Some of you know this, God is thrice holy. What does that mean? Twice in the Bible. Isaiah 6 verse 3, Revelation 4 verse 8, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts in Isaiah, Lord God Almighty, and in Revelation. What does holy mean? Holy means perfectly pure. Holy means cannot dwell where sin dwells. I have Habakkuk 113 on your outline. Habakkuk 113. Uh, hopefully I put it on there for you, says that God is of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. If God cannot look on sin, God cannot dwell on sin. And that means sin disqualifies us from being in the presence of God. You can go dwell in heaven with God if you are sin free. We're doomed, aren't we? We're doomed. Not only is God holy, God is also just. So not only do sinful people not get to go to heaven, sinful people need to be punished because God is just. Sin is justly punished. We rightly we don't, we don't have nearly the sense of justice God does. God is perfect in justice. But most people believe someone who does heinous crimes of killing, we believe they should be punished. We believe they should not be let God free. We believe that's an injustice. Well, God's holy meter is totally different than ours. And if we, in our fallenness, think certain things should be judged, God certainly does. God is just. And so not only does sin disqualify us from heaven, 
but our sin needs to be punished and the wages of sin is death it's separation from god like we talked about so god is holy god is just and thankfully god is also love and because god made man in his image and god loved man and god desires to have a relationship with us that ought to that ought to affect your heart creator wants to have a relationship with me that ought to affect our hearts and god is love and so his desire was like we talked about a few weeks ago the heart of god the heart of god does not delight in judgment but the holiness of god and the justice of god demand it and the love of god wants to restore an opportunity for us to have a relationship with him oh and let's not forget there are literally billions of people who have lived who have committed billions of sins that also need to be paid for and then god's plan of salvation has to have it be in such a way that man is man makes a choice man can accept what god did they can reject what god did god doesn't program us like robots i know that gets into election versus sovereign election sovereignty we've got all those kind of things that make our head hurt and you know my cop out on that right I don't have to do God's part, so I don't have to understand God's part. I just know that we are told, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are told that we need to do that. And so, we have God is holy, God is just, God is love. There's billions of people that have sinned, that sin needs to be paid for. There's... Uh, the, the thought that man also, man cannot do it himself, or he would boast, but man has a choice. That is all the things that had to be worked out for the plan of salvation. And so God made this plan please know this plan was made before he created earth and before he created man because he knew all the things that would happen so what was the plan god humbled himself by becoming a man and coming to earth and living a perfect life and dying a horrible death and being buried coming up out of the grave victorious. He paid the debt we owed and couldn't pay and allows us to be forgiven and to be his child. So God's holiness was satisfied because God's because Jesus' perfectness, his righteousness is put on us. It's considered ours. You're not perfect now, neither am I. But when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. Our sin was on Jesus and paid for. Jesus' righteousness is credited to us. And so we can, the, the holiness is satisfied. We have Christ's righteousness. The justice is satisfied. Jesus died for us. God's love is satisfied because he did that from love. We choose to say yes to his gift or no because the infinite God died on a cross an infinite amount of sins could be paid for. And because it was all of him. Man can take 
no credit. If that is not the wisdom of God, I don't know what is. That's that's that is the marvel of the wisdom of God. And so, uh, and I'm sure there's other thoughts, but that is why Christ crucified and resurrected is the power and the wisdom of God. Maybe some of you have seen this on on Facebook. Man, man, man can take no credit for salvation. I, I think I gave you this before and kind of butchered it. Now I got the quote. Jonathan Edwards put it like this. You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. You contributed nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. So how is Christ crucified and resurrected the power of God? We just saw that, right? The power and the wisdom of God of God. I would say it's the pinnacle of the wisdom of God. What about you? I started off with what do you think of when you hear the word cross or see a cross? It is the power and wisdom of God. Is, is it the power and wisdom of God for you? Have you trusted Christ? Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for your word. We, uh, Lord, uh, try as I might, uh, these thoughts are, are so great. And your, your word, as we think of your power, and as we think of your wisdom, uh, we try to put it into words, and, and yet uh, it just leads to more thoughts. Uh, we thank you that in your wisdom, your holiness, and your justice and your love was satisfied. Uh, we thank you that your plan met all those things and that you allow us to be forgiven. You made a way for us to be spared, to be freed from uh, the punishment of our sin. And we, we thank you that you did that because you loved us. Lord, I thank you that you know hearts. Father, I, I certainly don't know those that are yours and those that are not uh, the way you do. Uh, but Lord, I pray that if there's any here that do not know Jesus personally uh, as their Savior, that they have not trusted his way to get to heaven, that you would show them the danger that they're in and that they would come to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us that know this message, that understand a little bit about the power of God, that understand a little bit about the wisdom of God, that we would want to share that message with others. And Lord, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I just pray that each of our hearts would be so indebted and so full of gratitude and so uh, full of uh, love for you and appreciation that uh, we wouldn't, we couldn't help but share it uh, with other people. And so use this to work in our hearts. May we respond in the way you desire and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Just a minute, we're going to sing a, an invitation hymn. But there's two groups of people here this morning. Online, out here, two groups of people. We are saved or we are not. Saved or perishing, two groups. All is dependent on the cross. If we're born again, if we're forgiven, if we're a child of God, it's because of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Are we sharing that message? And I think you know, we need to ask God to help us do that. And secondly, if you're not born again, if you never trusted Christ, if, if you are not a child of God, you're in danger. You will perish. I, I shudder to think that God did all of that, what I feebly tried to describe, God did all of that 
and people would say, no, no thank you, I'll try my own way. That's certainly the wisdom of the world, isn't it? The arrogancy and the pride of men. Don't, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Art and Don are going to come. We're going to sing near the cross. Three hundred. Maybe Brenda's going to come. So I'm going to have to change my change my ways here. Three hundred thirteen. Invite you to stand if you can. Three hundred thirteen.